Paul's letter to the Colossians, first chapter, verse 15 and following. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in, ev that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. In this little series, Immortal Combat, Spiritual Warfare, I don't want you to forget where we're beginning. We're beginning with Jesus Christ. We shall be centered on Jesus Christ, and we will end with Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, and the last. He is the source, he is the center, and he is the summit of the church's life of all the universe. You have to begin there. Having done so, I'll make a statement which I've made many times before. A number of you, no doubt, have heard me say it. At the end, when the dust settles, and the smoke and noise of battle is blown away, and time gives way to eternity, you and I are going to be one of two things, a winner or a loser, heaven or hell. And it's that simple. That is in your face proof. And there's no getting around it. Now today there are people who don't like that. That offends them. That disturbs them. Good. Needs to disturb a lot of people. It is a disturbing reality. Some people say, I don't believe that. Doesn't change it one bit. Some people say, well, I just, that my opinion is something other than that. Fine. You're entitled to your opinion, but your opinion is erroneous if you don't believe that fundamental fact. At the end, forever, you and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Purgatory, relatively brief stop on the way to heaven. Purgatory, which is a doctrine of the faith, is temporary. Final purification. Everybody goes to heaven. You've made it. You get to purgatory, you're home free. <laughs> really? Well, maybe I shouldn't say free. It will cost you. But at least you're going to make it. St. Paul makes it very clear that we are at war. You could say that this passage of Scripture, Ephesians 6, verse 10 or so and following, could be the theme for this mini-series. St. Paul says to every one of us individually, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on the whole armor 
of God. I'll come back to that passage from St. Paul from time to time. But it is very, very clear that the Bible tells us, sacred tradition tells us, magisterial teaching tells us we are at war. A great many people don't believe it, don't know it, don't care. Now I'm going to tell you right now that this is not going to be your average conference or retreat. I have never done this particular series before. We're doing it here for the first time. I've said some of these things before many times in different homilies and sermons. But I've never put it together like this in one course. This is very important. Now, it's based on the doctrine of the faith. I'll often quote from Scripture, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and a few other documents from the Church. I didn't make this up. This is the Church's teaching. Now, some of what I say will be drawn directly from my own personal experience. I'll try to tell you when that's the case. You don't have to believe uh, my personal experience. That part is my opinion based on my personal experience. In the last 10 years of ministry as a priest, in that brief, relatively brief period, I've preached in almost all the 50 states and six foreign countries. I've seen quite a bit in that period of time. And I'll try to share with you some of the fruits of that experience. One of the greatest crises that we have at this time in history could be called a crisis of reality. We have a crisis of reality. You know how the news, they sometimes have a thing they say, reality check? You know, and then they tell you about something that's going on. Well, I'm going to tell you, we need a real reality check. A lot of people are out of touch with reality. God, by definition, is the pure and absolute reality. God is. I am who I am, God said to Moses. God is the absolutely, perfectly real. God's very essence is to exist. A lot of people are out of touch with reality because a lot of people are out of touch with God and all things as they relate to God. Do you know what a good working definition of insanity is? To be out of touch with reality. We live in a relatively insane generation. Out of touch with God, out of touch with reality. I'm going to speak to you about this, as I call it, immortal combat. I didn't really make up this concept of spiritual warfare, you know that, you've heard it before, you heard it right from St. Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. In this, I have to presume certain fundamental facts. The older I get, the less time I have for fooling around. I mean, I just don't have any time to waste engaged in arguments with anybody. What I am going to tell you in the next few hours, tonight, tomorrow, is based on the sacred deposit of the doctrine of the faith. Now there are a number of people in the last few decades who have, they should know better, but apparently they don't, and they do not accept certain fundamental tenets of our faith. Some of these people happen to be theologians. Some of them are priests. Some of them are even bishops. God save us. Well, it's true. When you know it's true. I'll give you an example. I've given this example a million times. And one more won't hurt you. The first time I ever preached at a major conference, I was right out of the university. I just earned my doctorate in sacred theology. And I was invited by accident to speak at a conference because somebody didn't show up, was sick or something, and they heard, oh, well, there's this new theologian. He just got a doctorate from in, in Europe, and uh, he's probably not doing anything, so let's get him over here. <clears throat> so they did. 
The keynote speaker at this conference was a very liberal theologian, and I happened to be sitting in the audience when he was giving one of his talks, which went something like this. Well, you know, we do not really believe in the existence and activity of angels. Uh, angels really, that, well, that's what we call a literary device. A literary device is something used in sacred scripture to make a point. But we don't really believe that they exist. An old lady in the front row hit her friend and said, I wish one of those literary devices would come down and kick his butt. <laughs> he went on, and we don't really believe in the devil. The devil is merely a figment of a medieval imagination. And we don't believe in purgatory, and we certainly don't believe in hell, because after all, a good God could never have a hell. On and on he went. Finally, he finished, and wouldn't you know it, he sat down right next to the old lady. And she couldn't hardly stand it. Now, she had reached that age where she just didn't care. You know about that age? I've reached it already. Well, she stifled herself as long as she could, but finally, she leaned over and whispered in the priest here, and she said, Father, you don't believe in hell? I said, oh, no, my dear. He said, well, when you get there, you will. <laughs> well, what I will have to say in the next eight hours is based on the sacred deposit of the doctrine of the faith. Now, I do not have time to set about proving all of the basic premises which my talk is based on. I assume you believe that there's such a thing as an angel. I assume you believe that there's such a thing as the devil. I assume you know that there is a war, a spiritual combat going on, and it is very violent. You don't have to believe me, though. Just listen to the church. St. John Chrysostom one time said, it certainly gives us no pleasure to speak to you about the devil. But the teaching which this subject gives me the opportunity to expound upon is of the greatest value to you. A few months ago, I, it was during Lent, I went and did a Lenten mission, and the pastor said, I want you to talk about hell. And I said, I don't really like to talk about hell. Nobody likes to hear that. Uh, we know it's true, there is such a thing, but you know, you don't want to overdo it after all. I prefer to emphasize the good things. I'd rather talk about heaven any day. He said, no, they don't believe, and a lot of my people don't believe, they've been told there's no such thing. So I said, well, all right, you're the boss. I'll do the best I can. I didn't want to, you know, chase the people away, though, the first night of the mission. And I didn't know how I'd begin, and so I got up in the pulpit, and I, the Holy, you know, it was one of those moments that Jesus talked about. He said, don't worry about what you're supposed to say. My father will give you the words. And so I began like this. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, this evening I'm going to begin with hell so that we don't end there. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> there is a lot of present day scorn, intellectual pride, concerning the truth, the reality of this spiritual combat. The sacred congregation for the doctrine of the faith at one point condition, uh, commissioned an expert theologian to prepare a study on, of all things, Christian faith and demonology. You know what demonology is? It's that branch of theology with de which deals with the demonic, with the devil. Now, the congregation, now this is the sacred congregation for the doctrine of the faith. That is the branch of the Roman Curia that deals with the doctrine of the faith, the teaching of the church. They strongly recommend it as a sure foundation for the reaffirmation of the magisterium's teaching on this subject. 
The document says, in fact, it would be an unfortunate error to act as if history had already been accomplished and the redemption had obtained all its effects without there being any further need to conduct the combat spoken of by the New Testament and the masters of the spiritual life. There is a combat. There is a battle. This is the war to end all wars. It wasn't World War I, and it wasn't World War II. What I'm going to talk about here, this is indeed the war to end all wars. My grandfather went off to World War I. My father went off to World War II. Some of my uncles went off to Korea, my generation, Vietnam. We always have a convenient war. In a war, if you are wounded in battle, that can be serious. It can change your life. You could even be killed in combat. But this combat, you get killed in this combat, it's permanent. The eternal consequences of this immortal combat. You and I, in Christ, are called to be warriors. Now you say, I, mean, I don't much feel like a warrior. Matter of fact, I'm 87 years old, and I can barely get out of bed in the morning. Oh, you're just in the right place. You're in the power seat. You've got big weapons at your command. It's called the cross, and that's where all the power is. A lot of times people, as they get older, they think that their usefulness, and the world promotes this, they think their usefulness is diminishing. If you had eyes to see reality as it is, you would see that your usefulness is coming to fullness. I don't remember very many lines from my doctoral thesis, but the one I always remember is, to be placed on the cross in Christ is to be set at the pinnacle of human possibilities. Why? For the very simple reason that no greater love hath a man, but that he lay down his life for his friends. Power of the cross. The seventh of these lectures will be on the cross as a weapon. Let me just give you a little uh, recap. You probably saw it in your, your uh, folder or the uh, schedule. The reality of this spiritual combat. That's what I'm talking about this hour. After that, healing and deliverance. Then humility. That's a spiritual nuclear weapon. I'll talk to you about that. Then the role of the sacramentals. And after that, the role of the sacraments. After that, our allies, the angels, saints, and souls in purgatory. In the final talk, the power of the cross of Christ. And then we'll have an hour of question and answer. What I'd like to have you do is, as you go uh, through this series of lectures with me, I want you to write down any questions you might have. You know, do it, start this evening, write it down on a piece of paper, make it short, and keep it to the point. Uh, don't ask me what I had for breakfast on the airplane this morning. Don't ask me how the weather is in California. Ask your questions on this subject matter. And I'll go through the questions and I'll attempt to, to answer as many as I can in that hour. Uh, a question is not a sign of ignorance. A question is a sign of intelligence. You want to know something. And that's something very, very intelligent. So don't be afraid to, to write down a few questions. All right, this war is absolutely real. The Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us man's life is a hard battle. Let me read to you uh, from paragraph 407 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The doctrine of original sin, closely connected with that of redemption by Christ, provides lucid discernment of man's situation and activity in the world. By our first parent sin, the devil has acquired a certain domination 
over man, even though man remains free. Original sin entails, quote, captivity under the power of him who thenceforth had the power of death, that is, the devil. That comes right from the Council of Trent. Ignorance of the fact that man has a wounded nature inclined to evil gives rise to serious errors in the areas of education, politics, social action, and morals. The dramatic situation of the whole world, which is in the power of the evil one, and that quotes scripture directly, right from first, first letter of John, first letter of Peter, this dramatic situation of the whole world, which is in the power of the evil one, makes man's life a battle. The words of the church, right out of the catechism. The whole of man's history has been the story of dour combat with the powers of evil, stretching, so our Lord tells us, from the very dawn of history until the last day. Finding himself in the midst of the battlefield, man has to struggle to do what is right, and it is at great cost to himself, and aided by God's grace, that he succeeds in achieving his own inner integrity. And so you see the reality, the reality of this spiritual combat, this immortal combat. The words of the church, and they are the teaching words of fathers, doctors, and saints. Nothing new. Now, I'm going to try to give you an overview here. Now, let me just stop for a moment. This is not rocket science. In case you think that you might have a hard time grasping this, forget that right now. This is not rocket science. Everybody here can understand this without any problem. Children can understand the basics of this. It is a matter of life and death to understand the basics of this immortal combat. When I enlisted in the Army back in the 60s, and the Vietnam War was going on, I was very zealous, very, very zealous. I had more zeal than brains. <clears throat> I've always been that way. So I enlisted in the Army with a, an enlistment commitment for Special Forces. I went in, and I went through a series of, well, training. You know, you go to basic training, you go to advanced infantry training, maybe you go to jump school, you go to special forces school, you go to jungle warfare school, all kinds of training. I had a lot of good teachers in the Army, and just like I had a real good coach in football in high school. I've often mentioned my old football coach from high school. There is one thing that characterized all of these men. They cared about the people that they were coaching or training. It was the military. But they were tough. Now, I went through, in the days before lawsuits, you understand. You see, when I was in, went into high school at the age of 14, that was uh, 1961. And when we went out on the practice field for the first time, Coach Hamlet came out in his formal attire, which consisted of Bermuda shorts and a T-shirt. He was the biggest, hairiest man I'd ever seen in my life. And he struck absolute fear into the heart of everyone on that field. Everyone. No matter how big and bad you were, you, wouldn't, you didn't even want to, you wouldn't think of crossing the coach. This was the good old days. He ran us right into the ground. I'll never forget the first day of practice. He ran us around and around. We did laps around the, the practice field until we could hardly move. Then he ran us wind sprints up and down the length of the practice field. He ran us till every last man was on the ground in agony, throwing up, heat prostration, literally. 
and it went downhill from there. <laughs> but by the time the first game rolled around, we went out on the field. We hated the coach. We were in a state of mutiny. We wanted to kill him. But we went out on the field that night, and, well, we won 62 to nothing. <laughs> we went in the locker room, and a collective light bulb went on. We realized what he'd done for us. He'd made us winners. When I went into the Army, I had a lot of NCOs, a lot of drill instructors who were that way. They'd already done two, three tours in Vietnam. They'd lived to tell about it. They wanted to keep us alive, but they were relentless, even brutal. They ran us into the ground, and then they ran us some more. Now, that was for a game, football, that was for a war where you could have been wounded and you could have been killed. What I'm talking to you about is a matter of life and death, eternally speaking. And so you will excuse me if I run your sorry butt into the ground. I'll give you an overview of this battle. In the beginning, God created all that is. He called everything into being out of nothing. How did he do it? By willing it. It's called creation. Who does that? The creator. Anybody else do that? Nobody else. Only God. Only God is the creator. Everything else is creation. And he brings it into being out of nothing. God does not require pre-existent matter to create. By definition, that's what creation is, to bring into being out of nothing, ex nihilo, out of nothing, as the Latin has it. And so God creates everything in the beginning. You know the creation account. That's the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, Genesis, first chapter and second chapter, creation. When he finished, God proclaimed it good, very good. Creation has to be good. It comes from the one who is goodness itself. Then the third chapter of Genesis. The serpent. The most subtle, it says. It says in Scripture, the most subtle of the creatures the Lord God had created. I often think of that when some of the more liberal of the brethren talk about nuancing, uh, the nuances of the faith, the subtleties of the faith. I remember who it was who was the most subtle of all the creatures the Lord God had created, the devil. And the devil says to Eve, the mother of all the living, or the first, our first parent, Adam and Eve, ah, so did the, serp or the servant says, so did God tell you you cannot partake of the trees in the garden. And Eve said, no. God said, we may partake of all the trees in the garden. Human freedom is very broad. However, God said, we may not partake of the tree in the center of the garden or even touch it lest we die. Human freedom has limits. And those limits are laid down by God. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that the original sin was pride. Eve looked at this. The devil said, oh, don't, don't, you don't believe God. Listen, he just doesn't want you to be like him. He knows if you partake of that forbidden fruit, from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was called. He knows you'll become like gods, knowing good and evil subjectively and arbitrarily. Eve saw that it looked good, and so she was moved by pride. Ah, I can be like God. I can decide subjectively and arbitrarily what is good and what is evil for me. Only God knows absolutely and objectively what is good and evil for his creation. He's the architect and author of it. We don't know. We're not smart enough. Arrogance, pride, hubris. And so what did she do? 
She bit into the big lie. What happened? Disobedience happened. She par partook of that forbidden fruit. Then what happened? Death. There was no suffering and death in the universe. God did not create suffering, pain, and death. That came about as the result of the abuse of free will. Now, look, at this is very important. What I'm talking to you about right here is the principle that will help you understand this whole thing. St. Thomas Aquinas often said, an error in the beginning is an error indeed. Don't make a mistake at the level of principles. Now get this, please. Pride is at the root of all evil. Pride is the original sin. What is pride? Pride is a lie. Its opposite, humility, is the acknowledgment of the truth. The truth of who God is, the truth of who I am, a creature, a speck in the cosmos. But Eve bought into the big lie. And what happened? Just what God said would happen. That's what happened. Death entered creation. Darkness entered Eden. And so from that instant on, you had the battle between truth and lies, good and evil, light and darkness, life and death. And really, it was a mirror image of what had taken place previously in what we call the fall of the angels. Now, this is noted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We find it in the writings of the fathers and doctors of the church. The angels, far superior beings to us, pure spiritual essences, they were given a test of some kind. Some of the fathers said they were shown the incarnation and redemption, God's plan, and how God would assume a human nature, become like one of us, and everything except sin. One of the brightest of all the angels was Lucifer. The very name means star of the morning or light of the morning, Lucifer. Now, light has to do with the intelligence, which has as its proper end the true. This bright angel, Lucifer, blinded by his own light, chose darkness, pride. No, I don't accept your plan, God. I don't like that plan. If you're going to assume a created nature, it'll be mine. Mine is the highest, mine is the brightest, mine is the best. I don't like your plan. I've got a better one. Non serviat. I will not serve. The rebellious pride of Lucifer, the devil, the serpent. The resounding retort, qui su Deus, St. Michael. The response from God's side. Qui su Deus, who is like unto God? And the battle was on. And you see, from the very beginning, the fall of the angels, it was pride, disobedience, death. That is the prototype of all evil. Don't forget that. Pride, disobedience, death. From the moment that Eve bit into the big lie and fell from grace, the entire created universe groaned in agony for a deliverer, a messiah, one who would deliver them from the bondage of evil. You understand that from that instant of the original sin, no one could go to heaven. Think a moment what it would be like if you had to approach death with no hope of heaven. That once you left this life, all you had to look forward to was darkness, Sheol, the dismal abode of the dead. Not a very pleasant thought. And so the chosen people, the Jewish people, prayed for the coming of a Messiah, a deliverer. In the fullness of time, 
God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. And so the eternal word, the only word our Heavenly Father ever spoke in the eternal silences of the Trinity, the eternal word, Jesus. He assumed the human nature through the power of the Holy Spirit and the fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so you see, we have creation, very good, and then we have the fall. How did evil come about? Now this is very, very fundamental and important to understand all the rest of this. God did not create evil. Everything God created is good, very good. God created all the angels. God created human beings. God created everything, and it's all good. How did evil come about? Through the perverse use of free will. The angels, pride, disobedience, death. We have fallen angels. Jesus said, I watched Satan fall from the heavens like lightning. And he took a third of the stars with him, the demonic forces. Now, this is very, very real. Uh, now, don't let me lose you here. A lot of people get gun shy when we get this far into reality. This is reality. We have spiritual enemies. They started out good. They rebelled. You know, when nowadays you hear a lot about dissent, I, I, if I were those people, I wouldn't boast about being a dissident. Do you know who the first dissident was? The first dissenter? Lucifer. He's the one who said, non servio. I would be careful about following him. The operative word is assent, not dissent. We assent to the doctrine of the faith. We are sent to the word of God. We don't dissent from the teaching of Jesus Christ as it's given to us through his church. We are sent to that. And so we have creation, and then we have the fall. Genesis 1 and 2, creation. Genesis 3, the fall. Fall of angels, fall of men, has the basic imprint. Pride, disobedience, death. And you can see that imprint all throughout history. You can see it today. It goes like this today, the arrogance. Well, I'm not going to listen to the Pope. I'm talking about Catholics here, not some other religion. A lot of Catholics talk that way. Oh, I'm not going to listen to the Pope. I don't believe what he says about artificial contraception. I mean, after all, shouldn't I have the right to choose? The only case I know of in all of language where you don't finish the sentence, right to choose what? Hmm? Think about it. That imprint, that prototype of sin. All right. The incarnation. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Now, the problem at its root is pride. What is the offset? Humility. The offset is humility. That's why one of the lectures I'm going to be giving, the third one in this series, is on humility. An awesome weapon in this immortal combat. Something that you have to know about, something that we have to live. Easy to know, not so easy to do. I've often reflected that I know more than enough to be a canonized saint. Unfortunately, no saint was ever canonized for what he knew, <laughs> only for what he did, right? Heroic virtue. That's not so easy. All right. The incarnation, the eternal word, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, assumes a human nature. He assumes a human nature, becomes like one of us. What did he do with that human nature? He took it to a cross. He suffered, he died, and he rose on the third day. Dying, he destroyed our death. Rising, he restored our life. That is the essence of this combat. It is in Jesus Christ 
that we have victory. Now, many people today make a terrible, terrible fundamental error. Now, they know that we have the victory in Jesus. They know that very well, and we do. Often when I become discouraged, my good Catholic mother will pick up a Bible and say, oh, my priest, my theologian son, don't we know the last chapter? We won, didn't we? That's right. We did. So Jesus wins definitively. He wins the battle. Jesus wins the war through his passion, death, and resurrection. And so we may say, well, so what's the big deal? <laughs> the big deal is this. You have to accept the victory. You have to enter into it and make it present in your own life. It is entirely possible for you and I to lose. How do you lose? You don't accept the victory. What's that called? That is called sin, S-I-N. That is real. No discussion of spiritual combat can be made without reference to sin. I remember once, one of the first Lenten missions I ever did, I went to a parish, maybe my second year ordained, and the pastor was a nice man, and he said, Now, Father, look, I know this is a Lenten mission, but I have good people. Please don't talk about sin. I said, What? I said, I don't know how not to talk about sin in a Lenten mission. After all, I thought Our Lady was the only one immaculately conceived. You know, some, some you know, your people are sinners just like me. We all are. Sin is real. I'm going to have to talk about the devil in this conference. He's real. You know, if God is the one who says, I am who I am, and you know he did to Moses. He told Moses, I am who I am. The devil's the one who says, I am who I am not as the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say. The devil has power if you think he doesn't exist. You know, I have met thousands of people all over the world. I have conversed with people who were at the top of their religious affiliations, whether they be Catholic, Protestant, Jews. And I've talked with hell's angels on their motorcycles. Uh, I've seen a wide spectrum of humanity. The ones that frighten me the most are the ones inside the Catholic Church who don't believe what the Catholic Church believes, those who reject these realities. I'll tell you, it's far easier to get a hell's angel to heaven than it is a theologian or priest who doesn't believe the basics of the faith. Far easier to get that pagan hell's angel to heaven than somebody inside the church who should know a lot better and doesn't. For the man who's been given more, more will be required. It's a very, very serious thing. So we have creation, good. We have the fall, bad, and the battle is on. It is in Christ that we have the victory. Uh, how do you get in Christ? Do, do you understand how we are in Christ? It's called baptism. Okay. Now, one of the talks I'm going to be giving is going to be on the sacraments and how the sacraments fit into this immortal combat. Another one will be on the sacramentals, which are like sacraments, but they're not sacraments, but they are signs which affect what they signify through the prayer of the church. You know, when you're in a war, I remember when I went in the army, <clears throat> you've got to know something about weapons and tactics. Now, what kind of a soldier would have a ghost of a chance of survival in a brutal war if he didn't know something about weapons and tactics? his own and the enemy, right? You want to know what your enemy is up to. Now, there may be some people even here, and I know you're all good people, but there may be some of you who are somewhat skeptical about some of this. 
You know, a lot of people uh, who don't know me will say to me, and I love it, oh, Father, you don't understand. I love it. Sometimes young people, teenagers, will say to me, but you don't understand. You know, they think they're, they're real uh, advanced, you know. They, they think maybe they did something new that their parents don't understand, or most of all, the priest doesn't understand. Let me tell you something. I was free basin cocaine in hell before you were born, little boy, little girl. I've been there, and I've done that. There isn't anything on either side I haven't seen. I have been in a recording studio when a major rock group dedicated their next album to Satan. I've been there with a, where the satanic priest dedicated that music to Satan where sacrifice, blood sacrifice, was offered. I knew major drug dealers who brought in witches and satanic priests to curse the cocaine by the kilos that they were bringing into the United States. And we're going to talk about that, the reverse of the sacramental principle. And the next time you smoke some dope, I want you to realize that some witch may have cursed it. And you may end up with a disease or a mental illness that hadn't even entered into your wildest nightmares. I have seen it. And so when someone says, oh, you don't understand, my credentials are long and broad. I've got five university degrees in theology and philosophy, yes, but that's not the end of it. I've been on the other side. I've been to the dark side and lived to tell about it. I've seen both sides. You know, people inside the church who should know better, many of them, don't believe these things. They think it's nonsense, old wild tales. It, it aggravates them and angers them that someone would talk about these things. But I guarantee you, I can go out in the street in any major city, and I can talk to any drug addict, alcoholic, or homeless person and ask them if they believe in the devil and you will never find one who says no. You want to know why? Because they've been there and they've seen it up close and personal. And so I want to tell you, this is real. This is real. This is a dose of reality that a lot of people just don't have the stomach for. But you who are called out of darkness into God's own marvelous light, you are called to transcend the worldly, atrophied vision of the secular age. You're called to be spiritual warriors, prayer warriors, those who will go into battle interceding for others. I knew a man back in the old days when I was in Hollywood, Los Angeles. He had been a rather successful man, like many of us were. And he went to the parties in the Hollywood Hills with the movie stars and the rock stars, and he made his millions, and he lost his millions. And he almost died from cocaine. He came back, he lived to tell about it, like many of us, he turned to the Lord. He works as a janitor. He'd been a high-powered attorney. He works as a janitor in a little job, makes barely enough money to pay for his little one-room apartment. And all night long, he gets up and kneels before a crucifix. And he intercedes for all the drug addicts all over the city, the city of angels, Los Angeles. He's probably a saint. He does it every night, all night long. He sleeps two, three hours. And then he goes and sweeps floors and cleans toilets. But all night long, he prays the rosary. And he refuses to forget those he left behind in the street. Someday he will be revealed as a great cosmic warrior. Every one of us is called to take our place on the battle line. Every one of us has a unique, precious, unrepeatable role to play. 
To the degree you correspond to that grace, souls will be saved. To the degree that you fail to correspond to that grace, souls will be lost. And you say, oh, don't be so dramatic. That can't be. I guarantee you that it's true. Most of us here are Catholics. That means we have the fullness of Christianity. That means we have seven sacraments, not just two. Five require a valid priesthood. We have all seven. You've been given the fullness of divine revelation. We have been given more, and more is required of us. But the vast majority of us sit back as though no battle were going on. We take our ease. We don't worry about God's little children who are in such terrible danger. When asked the great priest, the exorcist, Father Gabriel Amorth, was asked, who's in most danger? He did many, many exorcisms. He's an exorcist for the Isis of Rome. And he said, by far, young people. The young are in the greatest danger, by far greater danger than anyone else, any other category of persons. And when you think about it, it has to be true. When I think back to my youth, when the things I did in my teens, in my 20s, unbelievable that I lived through it. I mean, it's just absolutely unbelievable. A lot of us lived through a lot of things. I mean, that I didn't end up in the bottom of hell long ago is a miracle. Every once in a while, I'll talk about the rosary, and I will this weekend. Somebody will say, oh, that's an old lady's prayer. I said, let me tell you something. If it weren't for those old ladies, I'd already be in hell. Those old ladies pave heaven, so keep on praying. Men, too. Powerful. Rosary. So... Creation, very good. The fall, what was the fall? Pride, disobedience, death. That is the prototype. That's how evil ended creation. Then the incarnation. The eternal word assumed a human nature. Divinity and humanity were joined together through what we call the hypostatic union. God and man became one in the person of Jesus. Savior. And then Jesus, having assumed that human nature, he took it to a cross. He suffered, he died, and he rose on the third day. Why? To save us. The greatest hero who ever lived is Jesus Christ. He is a warrior. He is a warrior. You and I are called to follow him. And you cannot follow Christ without going to battle. And so, creation, the fall, the incarnation, redemption, and I will say now, and I hope you can grasp this, what we're talking about is man's participation in each of those categories. Creation, the fall, the incarnation, redemption. Each one of us participates in all those mysteries. To the degree that we are conformed to Jesus Christ, we will be effective in this immortal combat. And realize more than anything else that you are important, that you play an essential life and death role, that you are contributing to the salvation of your brothers and sisters. And one day, having fought the good fight, you're going to stand before God and before a host of souls, and they are going to thank you for your fidelity. They are going to thank you for remaining faithful, for fighting the good fight of prayer, of penance, of virtue, because the grace which we bring down through those means liberate souls, and bring them rejoicing to our Father's house.
We'll take a break, and then we'll come back for the next talk, which is going to be on healing and deliverance. I, if I had it to do over, I might put that later on in the series, uh, but uh, bring your seatbelt and fast.